The history of NASCAR can be defined by the look of the cars. It's a stroll through time, decade by decade. Tweaking, learning, building, innovation, motivation, generations. Now I'm a big fan of Richard Payne. And what's next? This is next. The seventh generation. The NASCAR Next Gen Car at the World Center of Racing in the Daytona 500. What's next is now. This is Countdown to Daytona, live. Fans have been making the annual pilgrimage to Daytona for racing since 1902 and here to the Daytona International Speedway since it opened in 1959. This was the scene this morning as fans and teams were revving up for the 64th running of the Daytona 500. In excess of 130,000 people will be here to enjoy the race. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Countdown to Daytona Live. I'm Kevin Conley. And I'm Will Kunkel, and I can't believe that we're finally here. <laughs> right. It's race day. It's February 20th. We have 100-plus thousand people, like you mentioned, and we're going to go racing. God willing, the weather's beautiful for the first time on a Sunday in two years, and we got a full team mm. to do it. We got Danny Harnden, we got Brett Baldeck, we got Carla Gebhardt, we got everybody today. Oh, no doubt about it. Guys, great to see you. We can't wait to hear the stories that you have. But you know, this is a brand new year and a brand new era of NASCAR racing, no yeah, doubt about it. This season's gonna be a lot of fun. It's gonna be a lot of different. So anybody that's tuning in for the first time today, yes, Today is the Super Bowl. Today is the World Series. Today is the Stanley Cup. The Daytona 500 is the biggest race of the season. That's how they start their year every single season here in Daytona Beach. And when you have a race like that, you got to have a trophy that is honored the way it is. The Harley J. Earl Trophy, one of the most coveted in all of sports, let alone in motorsports. Now, Harley Earl, for all of you that don't know, was a General Motors car designer who designed the Corvette, and it was a close friend of NASCAR founder Big Bill France. I need people like this in my life because he named the trophy after his friend as a sign of respect. Every driver who wins the Daytona 500 gets his name engraved on that trophy. You know, being able to win the Daytona 500 would certainly um, add to that legacy and, and what, what my legacy has been here, you know. So um, I've got two championships, and some other guys have Daytona 500 victories and, and no championships. So it's, it's kind of a give or take, but it would be nice to check off the box of, of getting everything. Yeah, it's definitely unique. You know, no other sport has their biggest event as the first one, right? So you sit all off season long, you think about racing, you think about how you're going to you know, go into this year with high expectations. You throw that on top of it being the biggest paying race of the year. There's a lot of reasons to go run good at this race. You know, just being able to be a part of it, right? Like I remember not too long ago thinking I would never have a chance to be a part of this race again, um, to think about winning it. I don't know. I don't know. Just going to gonna have to just roll with it and see, uh, see how the emotions flow if, uh, if that time does come. All right, again, 2022, a new era of NASCAR racing because of this redesigned race car. We're talking every nut, every bolt is brand new as these guys get ready to head out onto the track. Now, many of these parts and pieces and components are like what you have on the car you drive every day. As NASCAR was working on this car, drivers were providing feedback on what they liked and what they didn't like. It is that feedback which has gotten us to this point. The drivers have gotten a decent amount of track time and really seem to like the direction of this new car. It certainly has the potential to be the best race car that we've ever had. But like anything that gets developed and it's new, you'll have different versions of it. The new car has actually been more stable and more comfortable than we all expected in the draft. The way the, the steering works on these cars um, is going to make it feel a little different. The brake pedal feels a little different. There's not a ton of notebook kind of things you can go to from last year to apply to to this car. Something I'm for sure I know is that we're going to see an amazing race this weekend. Uh, this car drives incredible in, in the in the during the pack. 
All right, NASCAR spent years and millions of dollars to get this car right. Yeah, I think if you ask NASCAR, they would say this was a long and <laughs> arduous process. But if there's one guy in the world that knows everything about NASCAR and about this new car and how long it took, is my man Brett Baldeck. Brett, tell the people about this next-gen car. Well, Will, the next gen is right now. All 40 cars that are here in the garage in Daytona were designed and manufactured up north in Concord, North Carolina. So we paid a visit to the R&D Center to get a behind the scenes look at how this car was designed as well as some of the new features. Following thousands of miles of testing, NASCAR's next gen is now. Better or worse, we start the season off in Daytona 500, so it better be good. Brandon Thomas is the managing director of vehicle systems for NASCAR. He's been under the hood, so to speak, developing this car since starting his position three years ago. This was really the project that drew me here uh, to come work on. But planning for the now Generation 7 car started as early as 2017 with discussions among NASCAR's top leaders. We need to improve the look of the car. We need to modernize the platform of the car. We need to, we need to kind of get back into the stock car approach. Safety remains a top priority in NASCAR, and it always has been. In fact, that's why this R&D center was built. But the safety inside the next-gen car took a drastic turn on February 17, 2020. This car was already through prototype one testing phase. We were actually uh, constructing, had already finished the chassis construction of prototype three. That incident occurred. We took a lot of data and we made a lot of updates to the production car center section and driver compartment based upon that incident as well. In the new car, the driver has been moved farther to the right. The door bars protecting the driver are stiffer and have been moved to the left away from the driver. You won't notice those changes on track, but you will see the efforts to improve the racing product. Among the biggest change is a diffuser you can see from the rear of the car. The device is supposed to increase downforce, creating more grip. What we didn't want to create was a extremely high downforce vehicle, but we wanted to create a very efficient downforce generation device that also helped tailor the flow to the car behind it. The hope is a cleaner airflow behind a car won't disturb the aerodynamics of a car trying to pass. So as we know, a lot of testing has been done with this car from Charlotte here to Daytona to Phoenix. But the real test starts today, 500 miles of flag to flag racing in just a few hours with the green flag scheduled for 3.06 p.m. Eastern time. That's it for down here in the garage. But let's go on top of the garage to Danny with more. Yeah, when we were talking to the drivers earlier this week, they were telling us that it was kind of strange looking into the stands last year's Daytona 500 and only seeing about 30,000 fans. But this year, the fans are back in full force. It is a sellout. And many of those fans from all over the country pulling their RVs into the infield for a Daytona vacation. For 35 straight years, this has been Larry Reeves' favorite vacation. Just a great party. I mean, so much fun. You know, we always have a ball here. And you can have a beer, nobody bothers you. you meet good people every year, too. Yes, you make new friends, reunite with old friends, eat great food. Everyone has their specialty, like Larry's sausage gravy. You have some drinks, relax, and watch some racing. This youngster already working on their driving skills. Mike Wazileski brings his family down from New Jersey for an enjoyable week. And especially being from Jersey, it's cold out, so down here you get the great weather, 70 degrees, and just able to walk around, do everything with them, and uh, really just seeing them play, have fun, and enjoy themselves. It's, 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 an awesome, uh, it's an awesome time and experience. Brooklyn's Ryan Leahy has been a NASCAR fan for a long time. I have a picture of me nine months old uh, going to a NASCAR home track with beer in my baby trailer because dad had, dad had to have a way to sneak it in. So I've been loving NASCAR all my life. And being here at the biggest track in the world to me is the best thing ever. 
for these hardcore NASCAR fans, the Daytona 500 is something they just don't miss. I haven't made it was the year my dad died in 2007. I've been here since I was coming here since I was 12. Yeah, we even met a couple of people that flew in from England to see this race. And this Daytona 500 vacation is not cheap. If you bring an RV, you have that, you got parking, you got food, you have drink. And as far as tickets, yes, it is a sellout. You could have gone on to StubHub, get tickets right on the start finish line for about 700. Again, Daytona vacation, not cheap, but it's a once in a lifetime experience. Oh, what a beautiful day for the Daytona 500. Kevin and Will, let's go racing. Yeah. Oh, no doubt about that, Danny. We're located in the fan zone, Will, and it is great to see so many fans. It's also great to see so many families out here, a lot of young, young race fans. Yeah, we got a lot more coming up here, and I got a question for you. <laughs> this guy, Dale Earnhardt Jr., has won two Daytona 500 championships, but will he make it another? Dale Earnhardt Jr. ever race in the Daytona 500 again? Never say never. We go one-on-one -on -one with Dale Earnhardt Jr. when we come back. All right, plus Brad Keselowski enters a new chapter in his career. He's now a NASCAR Cup Series car owner. The fastest Daytona 500 was in 1980 when Buddy Baker won with a speed of 177.602 in a race that was slowed five times by caution. Baker started on the pole and led 143 of the 200 laps. Only three Daytona 500s have had zero cautions, 1959, 61, and 62. The most cautions in a Daytona 500 was 16 in 2011. 40 drivers will start the Daytona 500, Will, in just a couple of hours. Yeah, we had a lot more than that come on down here, but now 40 <laughs> actually get to race, and five of those are rookies in the Great American Race. But there are three that are Cup Series rookies that have full-time rides. That includes Todd Gilliland. He will drive the 38 car for Front Row Motorsports. He is the son of former Cup driver David Gilliland. And then a similar story with rookie Harrison Burton. This kid is just 21 years old, and he will be 
in his age sake car, the 21 car for Wood Brothers. And the third rookie is Austin Sindrick, who takes over the two car from Brad Keselowski at Penske. And friends, yes, but out on the track, no, no, no. It's about racing. It's a competition. Yeah, it is really cool. You know, me and me and Harrison were teammates at, in the truck series, and um, you know, I think he's probably like my best friend now. So we talk every day. Cedric, I haven't talked to him too much, but we did a rookie deal yesterday. He seems really cool too. So even though we're friends, we still race each other really hard, and and that's something I, you know, I think is cool about the the you know some of the younger generation coming up is I mean we'll race each other crazy hard, and then you know, be okay with it afterwards. I'm not out there to beat two other guys. I'm out there to beat 40 other guys. So uh, for, for me, it's definitely not top of mind. But uh, the way I see it is if I do my job and try and contend on a, on a weekly basis up at the front of the field where I'd like to be, um, I, I guess the rest will sort itself. All right, we just touched on some new drivers. How about a new team? Carla Gebhardt joins us now with more on a new two-car operation. Carla? That's right, Kevin. It is a two-car operation, but it's actually four drivers going to help try and propel Colleg Racing into the Cup Series this season. And of those four drivers, three of them were in the Xfinity Series Championship last year. And if you ask Matt Colleg, the owner of Colleg Racing, what he thinks about his new driver lineup, he says it's a winning formula. New car, new series, same goal. For NASCAR's newest Cup Series team, it's all about this. Bailey crosses the finish line and wins. Coleman Digger will cross the yard of bricks, the winner of the first ever road course race for the Cup Series. <laughs> Let's go! College racing has made quite the name for themselves. In just six seasons, they brought home 15 career wins, with eight of those coming in the 2021 season. The winning standard is set, but this season they're accelerating into uncharted territory with two full-time teams in the Cup Series, a goal that's been in motion for quite some time. We've been dabbling in it and kind of getting prepared to be full-time, you know, for a couple of years now. So um, we feel like we've done a really good job in the Xfinity Series and, and want to continue to do that. But, um, you know, very, very, very exciting times for our drivers and our team. One of those drivers, Justin Haley, makes his mark in history, becoming the first full-time driver in the Cup Series for Colleg, a moment he's waited for since he was nine years old. Exciting, but it's also a little nerve-wracking, right? Um, being the first full-time driver, obviously Colleg's had a lot of success in the Cup Series already. Been a small part of that, been a large part of the Xfinity. They actually gave me my big break three years ago to get into the Xfinity Series. I don't think I'd want to you know, start my rookie season with anyone else. Colleagues driver lineup now consists of three of the championship four Xfinity drivers from 2021. AJ Allmendinger, along with Daniel Hemrick and Noah Gragston, who were added this offseason, will split duties driving the 16. We're going to have all the tools that we need. Now, with that said, I mean, it's the Cup Series. It's the best of the best. You don't just go in there, even if it is a brand new car. Matt Colleague owns everything. He owns every car. He's the leader. He's the motivator. Obviously, there's Chris Rice in there who who manages it all. We want to be competitive, right? So you hire the people to make you be competitive and the great people. But at the same time, we work really, really hard at making sure that we have fun. So many unknowns lie ahead as they get into their rookie season, but they'll continue to vie for victory lane. And that starts in Daytona, where Haley has four wins. And of course, it's always a challenge when a new team comes into the Cup Series. So now the question becomes, can Colleg Racing reach their lofty goals like they did in the Xfinity Series? Of course, Kevin, we only know time and more racing will tell us that. All right, Carly, thank you very much. And one thing about that team, they know how to celebrate when they get a victory. You know what? Drivers hopping from one team to another from year to year. That's been called the NASCAR silly season, Will, for as long as I can remember. Okay, so then what do you call this season? <laughs> this is race season. This is fun season. <laughs> this, this is off, go time. This offseason was mm -hmm. out of control. I mean, I talked mm -hmm. to Corey LaJoy the other day, and he said he keeps forgetting that Brad Keselowski is no longer <laughs> in the two car. He's now with the six. So 
get your etch sketch out. Here are all the notes and changes of what you need to know. Here are some more significant ones, though. The 6, the 42, the 45, and the 31 cars all involved. Like I mentioned, Kozlowski over to the 6. Ty Dillon, he's back. He's full-time racing for the 42 car for Petty GMS. And then you have Kurt Busch. He's out of the 1, into the 45 for 23-11 racing. And then you have Justin Haley in the 31 for Colleg. I hope you... Got all that, Kevin. Yeah, there will not be a test. Now, Brad Keselowski, who has always been outspoken about the well-being, the overall well-being of the sport, put his money where his mouth is. He bought a piece of Roush Fenway Racing to form RFK Racing. He'll drive the number six car, and Chris Busher is in the 17 car for RFK. If the results from the dual qualifying races are any indication, this move will be a success. Busher won his race, and Big Brad won his as well. Going to victory lane right out of the box on this new venture, that's pretty amazing. Made some good moves, good pitch strategy to get us in spot, and then uh, two or three to go, made the right move here down the uh, trial to take the lead, and um, that's really special to, to get our first win together in Daytona. It'd feel even better if we can do it on Sunday. You know, the first uh, official start of the season, you get them 10 points. Win at Daytona is never a bad thing as well, and uh, good momentum for Sunday and a good way to get this team kind of rolling. All right, this next-gen car is not only a big adjustment for drivers, it's also a huge adjustment for crew chiefs. Yeah, I always talk about these pit crews like they're umpires or like they're, you know, offensive linemen. If you're talking about them, it's usually not a good thing, but they play such a huge role in you winning a race, let alone a championship. So let's go out to Danny Harnden. And Danny, these guys have a lot to learn because there's a lot of new changes today. Yeah, and they're so important. And here's a great example. Last year, final pit stop, final race of the year in Phoenix. Yes, Kyle Larson's crew pulled off their fastest pit stop of the year, 12.34 seconds. It moved him from fourth place to first place. He'd go on to win the race. He'd go on to win the championship. These pit crews are so vital to the success. We caught up with the pit crew team over at Richard Childress Racing. Racing is a true team sport, and the pit crews are so incredibly important. When the car comes in, it's showtime. Yeah, when that yellow flag comes out, I mean, I don't care how long you've been in the sport, your heart, you know, you get that little jolt and that drop when you see that yellow flag come out. And business in the pits will be different this season in the Cup Series. The tires have just one big lug nut instead of five. The air gun is heavier. The tires are wider but lighter. Off-season testing was so important. All right, so let's not force anything with these four tire stops. We know where we make the money at. There are so many unknowns right now. The times will be the best the sport has ever seen. At the shop, this RCR crew is doing four tire stops in nine seconds. That's a huge change from the usual 30-second pit stops from the 1970s and 20-second stops in the 1980s, and even blowing away the famous Rainbow Warriors of the 1990s. Well, you know, I like to say those 1970s guys are the trailblazers for us. And now, most teams have found that former college athletes, especially football players, can make excellent pit crew members. It just, everyone wants bigger, stronger, faster, right? And I think they just started taking guys that had this athletic ability. They want a bigger jack man to get on the car that can still move. Um, they want smaller, faster guys that can change tires. They want a little bit of a bigger guy to fuel. Pit road's always, I think it's always been the best part of the race and uh, it's going to be even more so this year. Back to the football connection, linebackers seem to make the bet best pit crew members in that piece a linebacker from Nebraska who played there and a linebacker from Bowling Green they are quick they are strong they are powerful and you know what guys these guys are so strong they have muscles on top of muscles they could also be security for the drivers as well I guess <laughs> hi Danny thank you very much and again those guys jumping out in front of those race cars when they're coming down pit road that takes some nerve. Yeah, takes put, some nerve. put a shoulder in the <laughs> All right, folks, it is just looking absolutely great down here at Daytona in the fan zone as we gear up for the Daytona 500. A little bit later, Luke Combs, the Grammy Award-winning recording artist, Luke Combs will be performing the pre-race concert. I know a lot of fans are certainly looking forward to that. Much later tonight, which driver will be standing in victory lane like Michael McDowell did just a year ago?
Michael McDowell with one of the biggest upsets in all of NASCAR history. Will, will we see an upset this time around? Well, not if it's going to be Kyle Larson winning because he put together one of the greatest NASCAR seasons we have ever seen. And then he went on to win the Cup Series championship. And then he kicked off 2022 by winning the pole for the Daytona 500. And up next, you get to hear from him. Daytona International Speedway is called the World Center of Racing. It opened in 1959 with a price tag of $3 million. In 2016, the Speedway completed a $400 million facelift, making it one of the largest outdoor sports stadiums in the United States. You know what? There was a special connection between the Earnhardts and Daytona. Dale Sr., the late Dale Sr., he was a master here, and for that matter, so was Dale Jr. Yeah, Jr.'s got, actually had more wins than his dad, Sr., which is pretty crazy. But I had to say, listen, Dale Jr., you got a ton going on right now. It's time that you and I sit down. We go one-on-one. -on -one. We talked about his life, his legacy, everything going on. We talked about everything, basically, except for his vodka. Getting inducted into the Hall of Fame is obviously incredible for all the fans and for yourself, but to earn that adulation and that affirmation and that confirmation, if you will, from all of the drivers and your peers, what does that mean to you when you sit there and be like, wow? Yeah, I, um, I really, like, my fuel is that confirmation and, and someone saying, you know, that, man, I value you, you know, and you're important to, to me, you're important to this. That affirmation, I, that, that, that's the fuel that, that I need in my tank, right? And uh, everybody has sort of a different language, you know, that, that gets them going and keeps them motivated. And some people, it, it, it's, 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 uh, some people it's material things or some people it's, it's different. But uh, for me, I always needed affirmation. I always needed someone to be telling me you're making the right choice. You were talking earlier, this is a time to kind of slow down and reflect on everything you've done. What does it mean to you emotionally to just know that you're gonna be next to your dad in the NASCAR Hall of Fame? I mean, that's a big statement and pretty cool. Yeah, it fills a void in my life. Um, it, 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 it's easy to say it checks a, checks a box, but it really does fill this sort of personal void. A son loves to get his father's approval and 
I have, you know, I've, I've not had his approval for a long, long time. You know, he's been gone for 20 years now. And so I've really wanted to know what he would think in a lot of scenarios in my life, in a lot of moments. And he just wasn't there to give me his words. And uh, there's only rare moments where I know for sure what, you know, that he would be proud, that he would be happy, that he would be pleased 100% without a doubt, and this is one of those moments. Will Dale Earnhardt Jr. ever race in the Daytona 500 again? Never say never. You know, <laughs> I, I don't think I have any plans to do it in the near future, but time's running out. If I want to do that, I better hurry up. But <laughs> I don't think I'm ever going to do it again, but you never say never. Ah, uh, Dale Jr., always open and honest. You know, Michael McDowell, he hung around this sport for years just trying to win a Cup Series race. His dream became a reality last season. It's on top. Oh, teammates. Around they go and a hard crash. I think McDowell's the winner of this race, well, guys. You know, I dropped out of school when, after eighth grade and just pursue my, my driving dream. And, you know, I moved out at 16 years old and traveled to Europe and raced. All I've ever done is raced. So I'll be a 40-year-old with no job experience and no education having to provide for my family. So racing was uh, the best bet for me a lot of those years. Michael McDowell's bet on himself finally paid off in winning the 2021 Daytona 500. The Bob Jenkins front row motorsports crew is celebrating on pit road. The very first moment was when they said 34 to victory lane because I was sitting there waiting, trying to, trying to figure out, did I win, did I not win? I thought I won, uh, but with the caution coming out, you just don't know until they tell you officially. Until that moment, McDowell was best known for his crash during qualifying at the Texas Motor Speedway. I have never seen anything like that in my life. You know, that, that Texas crash is for sure a part of my history in the sport because it was such a, a big one, right? It's, it just doesn't go away. That never really bothered me, that thought of that being your highlight. What bothered me more than anything was to be in this sport for 15 years and to race you know, 350 some odd races and not get a win, that really bothered me more than anything. Now McDowell has two major career highlights and looking to make some more starting at Daytona. Hey, from the Daytona 500 champion, let's go to the Cup Series champion. Kyle Larson had quite the year last year. Yeah, I'd say so. Now, it's one thing to win a championship. It's another thing trying to stay on top because you've got everybody clawing at you, trying to bring you down and get crown champion yourself. So let's bring in Carla Gebhardt because this dude's trying to go back to back, Carla. That's right, guys. Kyle Larson, though, is a true comeback story. He was the driver that used a racial slur in an iRacing event nearly two years ago at the start of the pandemic. And he actually came back from this, got a second chance with Hendrick Motorsports in that number five car and went on to have a monster season, winning 10 races, the all-star race, and the first championship of his career. Now, as good as last season was, Larson is focused on the future and what he can do this year. And he's off to a pretty Pretty good start. He'll be on the pole to start the Daytona 500, but he knows Daytona hasn't been his best track over the years. Well, at this track, my first experience, I ended up in the catch fence in a nationwide race, and then my first 500, I remember hitting the wall like lap two and uh, having to kind of dig ourselves out of a hole in that race and then ended up crashing again at some point. So I haven't had the best experiences here other than uh, you win the Rolex 24 hour race. And Larson knows that he is the guy to beat this year, and he knows his track record maybe isn't the best here at Daytona, but he's certainly the guy to beat this season, guys. Yeah, Carl, I asked him at Media Day on Wednesday. I said, Do you recognize you're the best driver on planet Earth? He's like, oh, no, I don't really yeah. know. But it's unde undeniable, especially after he won the poll, after what he did in 2021. Hum humility's not a bad thing every <laughs> once in a while. How about this new car, though? It's going to be interesting to see how he does in this new car. Remember what happened to Jimmy Johnson. Once they got that new car, he kind of fell off a little bit. But this affects everybody, not just the drivers. It affects the pit crew, the crew chiefs, everybody involved in the race team. I'm yeah, no doubt is. about that. But you know what? We're going to roll on now with countdown to the 500, countdown to the Daytona 500. Folks, can you feel the energy? We certainly can feel the energy here still ahead 
This overhaul of this car is absolutely amazing. Plus, Kyle Busch, he's won just about everything there is in NASCAR except the Daytona 500. It is the missing piece on his Hall of Fame career. We'll be right back. Daytona International Speedway is two and a half miles in length with 31 degree high banked corners. The track has more than 100,000 permanent seats, 40 escalators, 17 elevators, plenty of concessions, restrooms, and of course, great views on three concourse levels along its nearly one mile long front stretch. I mean, well, this is a crazy lineup. There's a lot of guys in here that are really good that have never won the Daytona 500. Dale Sr. took them 20 years. Yeah, no doubt about that. And there are some really strong drivers in this field. We're talking guys that potentially will be in the Hall of Fame. Martin Truex Jr., he's a former champion. How about Kyle Busch? It's the only thing missing on their Hall of Fame resumes. It's just a tough race to win. You know, everybody brings everything they have here. It's the first race of the year. Um, you know, we typically have a lot of crashes, and a lot can happen. And, you know, you just uh, keep putting yourself in position. You know, eventually, uh, you know, maybe catch a little bit of luck one way or the other, and, and certainly we need some of that here. You know, being able to win the Daytona 500 would certainly um, add to that legacy and, and what what my legacy has been here, you know. So um, I've got two championships, and some other guys have Daytona 500 victories and, and no championships, so it's, it's kind of a give or take, but it would be nice to check off the box of, of getting everything. Oh, you can hear it. They want it. They want it, Will. Yeah, with this new car, as if these crew chiefs didn't have enough to worry about, you know, taking care of their driver. Let's go out to Danny Harden because, Danny, these crew chiefs now even have more to worry about, it seems like. Yeah, a crew chief is kind of like a head coach of a sports team like baseball or basketball. They have to make those really tough decisions under pressure. And with this new next-gen car, it seems like everything about their job is changing a bit. For NASCAR crew chiefs, learning to build the next-gen car is a different game and maybe out of their comfort zone. I'm comfortable with it. It is it's it is a bit odd, you know. Somebody saying, hey, here's, here's, here's what you need to do. You know, I've put plenty of Legos together in my life, so I'm gonna... <laughs> it's all new to us. 
um, a lot of new things we've never seen or laid our eyes or hands on. Uh, so this offseason has been very different, a learning process for uh, all teams all across the industry. Gone are the days of specialists. Every team member is starting from scratch, and they're all looking for the same thing. Speed. You know the guys who have assembled these cars for years. You know it's a it's a different process. You know every every part on it is different. So that's kind of the whole design of the car, really. Um, where as before, a lot of you know teams had specialized guys. Now you know we don't want one guy that can can do just one thing. You know, they're having to do multiple jobs. So the real question is, where is the advantage in this car, and will the big teams still outrun the small ones? You know, is it make more opportunity for the smaller teams to win. Well, what you're describing, you know, if we still have an advantage, we're getting back four times that information, right? Gibbs will have that advantage and, and Stuart Haas and the guys with multiple cars. And then it comes down to driver talent. The next gen car could potentially expose some mediocre drivers that have been in superb equipment the last few years. Obviously, the cream's always going to rise to the top, you know, but uh, I think, uh, you know, some of the smaller teams that, that don't have the huge budgets and, you know, get to spend countless hours in the wind tunnel and, and develop cars and stuff like that with a level playing field, I, th I think you may see some. Uh, some new, young, upcoming drivers kind of make a name for themselves. The big teams are not worried, but the small teams are excited. I do think it's going to level the playing field, especially for some of us smaller teams. We know we're going to the, to the racetrack with the same parts and pieces as everyone, right? You know, we don't have to worry about developing the hot new piece to, you know, to find the extra downforce. Or we, we've already got it. And there is no reason that we can't go execute a weekend and, and have solid finishes and even maybe contend for wins uh, throughout the year. The driver crew chief relationship is so important. Chemistry is key, especially early in the season with the new car. Will, patience. And there may be a lot of yelling back and forth on the radio, but patience both ways there. So patience is a virtue even when you're driving 200 miles an hour. It's hard to believe. And I don't have much patience right now because we are now inside 120 minutes from the great American race finally starting today. All right, this is again a live look atop of the garage area, looking down as teams are making the final preparations for today's race. All right, will those final adjustments, guys, be the difference between winning and losing? And here is a look at pit road always. Always a ton of activity out there before the race. Fans and everybody out there, which team will make that money stop, though? We got all that when we come back.
Daytona International Speedway has its own lake, Lake Lloyd, that was created as the dirt was excavated from the land to build the track's high banked corners. Lake Lloyd is 29 acres and is stocked with fish for race fans who may also want to spend a little time fishing while at the track. Hey, when basketball great Michael Jordan decided to become a NASCAR team owner, he told his driver, Bubba Wallace, hey, if we do this, we're not riding around in the back, man. No, they got a win last year, too, in that range shortened race in, in uh, Talladega. Talladega. Yeah, and it was also the first win by a black driver since 1963 when Wendell Scott did it. And now that win also got him into the playoffs. So this that was a big-time win for 23-11. And obviously, Bubba Wallace, we could keep getting paid by MJ, but... The expectation is much higher this year in 2022. He gained a teammate as well in Kurt Busch. Now, Bubble realizes that he's a role model for so many in the black community, but he would really like to just be known as a consistent winner outside of the track, and maybe that will happen this season. Whatever we, we seem to figure out on speedway racing, it seems to work out. Um, and so I don't plan on changing a thing uh, going into Sunday. We just have to... Uh, be methodical. Be uh, be smart about our decisions. It'll be uh, it'll be fun to figure out. But you know, speedway racing and 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 our team seem to go together really well. Hey, when we come back, we're going to go around the track for some sights and sounds here at Daytona. And finally, we got a packed house here. Like 130,000 guys and gals are going to be around here. It's going to be so much fun. And we've got all those sights and all those sounds for you when we come back because the atmosphere right here, it truly is like a state fair in Texas. <laughs> it's a carnival, my man. All right, racing at 200 miles an hour, just inches apart is dangerous. But if you're thinking about the danger, you're not thinking about winning, according to one driver. We are just over two hours away from the green flag, and fans started getting here dark and early at Daytona International Speedway for the 64th running of the 500. Now, fans obviously anxious, but excited to see their first time the next-gen car on the racetrack. But let's be honest, fans are ready to get back to a normal life after nearly two years of dealing with these lockdowns. All right, let's check in with Danny Harden and Carla Gebhardt. They've been wandering around the speedway, checking out the sights and sounds. Danny, let's start with you. 
As we, Kevin, we are on top of the fan zone. Maybe the best place to watch this race in the entire area here. It's, this is the group from Biloxi, Mississippi coming in. Who's going to win the race today? Alex Bowman, the showman, baby. Let's go. Right. Haley, this is your first race ever. What are you, what are you feeling now? I'm, I'm having fun. <laughs> All right. Who's going to win? Back to back, Michael Medow. Michelle didn't want to be on TV, but we're going to ask her. Harvick. Go Harvick. Harvick. There you go. Carla, kick it over to you. All right, thanks so much, Danny. Yes, we are in the garage right now. The crew members had la one final hour this morning to make last-minute changes before the final inspection. I got to talk with Denny Hamlin's crew chief, Chris Gabehart. If he was maybe nervous about sending that next-gen car into inspection, he said he was not. Maybe a little apprehensive about what is going to happen once that car gets on the track. Now, as far as the number 11 goes in inspection, they cleared on the first time as well as other JGR members. Another notable two, Kyle Larson, Alex Bowman, going to make up that front row they cleared inspection as well so they're ready for the great american race guys all right carla thank you very much again love to see all the activity yeah it's so great we got families in the pit crews we got families in the haulers we got families everywhere this is a family sport you got the earnhardt's you got the wall trips you got the dylan family i could go on for like 10 minutes about all the families here <laughs> yeah man, there's no doubt about that there's also the bush family the bush brothers you got kyle and kurt bush and they have been very successful and they really want to get after it because they're sort of like teammates this year all right in the past their relationship has been a little frosty at times but <laughs> Hey, it speaks to their competitive nature. They really do seem to be in a good place right now, and they are looking forward to working together on that Toyota team. But it's funny to hear them describe their interactions. There's been a couple moments already where we're, we're smiling at each other, and I called BS on something, and the whole group can laugh because nobody else really wanted to call it out, so I used my brother card. Yeah, he... Um... He, he likes to be a little bit of a showman behind the scenes where I'm just up front showman. So um, he'll, uh, he'll pull that older brother card a lot. But at the same time, he's got the most seniority at Toyota, and I have to respect that seniority and, and what he's done to build this brand. All right, we saw that terrible wreck last night in the Xfinity race. Myatt Snyder luckily walked away unscathed, but those big wrecks, that's a part of speedway racing. Yeah, and it's not something you can think about while you're racing a car at 200 miles an hour. you got to be completely focused on everything that you're doing, and Joey Logano is one of those guys that said, you're thinking about that, you're in trouble. I don't even want to think about it. Uh, I, I don't think about not crashing cars. It's just not, it's not in my DNA. It's not, it's not productive to go out there and try to win if you're scared of wrecking uh, right you just you won't win if that's your mentality so you have to be willing to take risks and if we crash we crash we'll get another car side and I, I, ironically though Logano had to get another car he's in his backup car today because he crashed out of the dual qualifying race on Thursday night I'll while trying to protect we'll his lead right an back. unnecessary move frankly but he threw a block Chris Busher he got the win. The contact sent Legano, Legano into the wall and into a backup car for today's 500 race. Didn't think the 17 was going to get a run that quick. Like he wasn't, he didn't fall back that far, and it came to me so fast. And I reacted to try to block it, and I should have just let it happen. And uh, it's a dumb mistake. Ooh. All right, we'll be right back with our predictions.
All righty, folks, time now to make our predictions because we're closing in on the start of the Daytona 500. All right, before you do that, we got to let you know where you want to put your money, what the odds are, how you get the biggest bang for your buck. We know who's at the top of the leaderboard. We know that's Danny Hamlin. We know that's Kyle Larson, Ryan Blaney, good money as well, followed by Chase Elliott, Joey Logano, and Brad Keselowski. Danny, who you got, though, bro? Well, here we go. I'm going with a guy who has had two heartbreaking runner-up finishes in the Daytona 500, Ryan Blaney. Back in 17, he lost to Kurt Busch by a couple of feet. A couple of years ago, he loses to Denny Hamlin by inches. Ryan Blaney, today's winner. The winner of this year's Daytona 500 ended last year's 500, wrecked in turn three, throwing his helmet at his own race car. That's Brad Keselowski, who's already had a great start to the week, winning the duels, and he'll win the 500 tonight. All right, my first thought was to go with Joey Logano, but he crashed his primary <laughs> car, so I'm going to switch over to... Chase Elliott, his dad was great here at Daytona. Chase Elliott wins the Daytona 500. All right, this isn't like to be most creative, go out <laughs> on the biggest limb. I'm going with the best driver on earth. It's Kyle Larson, also with Hendrick Motorsports. Kyle's going to win today, and he's going to win everything else. All right, Carla Gebhardt, she's going to go with Brad Keselowski as her pick. But, Will, what a fun hour. It went by really fast. Really excited about today's Daytona 500. I just love seeing all the fans out here. No masks. We're outdoors. <laughs> We're in Florida. It's sunshine. We're going to go racing on a Sunday for the first time in two years. I, it's a great American race. That's Daddy, right, right that's right, that's right. Folks, thank you very much for watching. For Will, for Danny, for Carla, for Brett, I'm Kevin Conley. Good night, everybody.